food systems universe, we've also helped set up um, a grant fund through private donations. Um, and that you can find at cofoodsystems.org. So that's a great place if you or anyone you know in agriculture has uh, is struggling right now. Of course, the financial scenario for a lot of our producers is always tenuous and you throw in a global pandemic and the markets with the way they are and we are worried about folks falling through the cracks. Um, so this is a great place to send people, cofoodsystems.org. It's also a great place to donate. Um, and all of those funds go directly to food and ag, to farmers and ranchers and other folks uh, working in the food system and struggling right now. So just a ton of great work going on. Um, glad to be able to update you. Thank you for the time here. And uh, if I may, uh, Director Zimmerman, uh, kick it over to Wayne East for a couple of updates from our animal health division as well. Uh, Thank you, Commissioner excuse Greenberg. Me. Excuse me, uh, Commissioner Zimmerman, we're finally uh, streaming live to YouTube. Great, thanks, Dion. Thanks for the You're update. Welcome. Yeah, sorry um, to interrupt you guys, sorry. No worries. Wayne, do you want to keep going? And then I know we've got a couple of commissioner uh, questions, comments for either Kate or Wayne. Okay. Well, thank you, Commissioner Greenberg and Madam Chair. I just wanted to give an update, a quick update on rabbit hemorrhagic disease. Uh, we had our first case in Colorado down in Alamosa County. That was actually in a, a wild cottontail, but subsequently CDA uh, had a report in Garfield County, and we've got that investigation that's ongoing. We haven't gotten samples back, test results back on that one. We also had an additional suspected case down in Dolores County. Unfortunately, by the time our field staff got there, we were unable to collect any viable samples. Um, but that led to this last Saturday, we got a call Saturday night, actually, and CBA received a call about some feral rabbit mortalities uh, down in El Paso County in Calhan, which is just east of Colorado Springs. Uh, they were exhibiting some rabbit hemorrhagic disease symptoms prior to death, and, and so we actually had a local homeowner call this one in. I first reached out to Director Prinslow and then subsequently Regional Manager Ackerman and, and ultimately was put in contact with District Wildlife Manager Corey Adler. And even though it was after nine o'clock on a Saturday night, everyone was professional and courteous. I really appreciate that. I want to thank all three of them, especially Officer Corey Adler for collecting two rabbits for sampling as well as disposing, disposing the other mortalities. And I just wanted to give a shout out to everybody for the collaboration and thank you for taking my call at a, at a late time, a late hour on a weekend night. Thank you, Wayne. Um, it sounds really scary when you say it out loud. Hemorrhagic, right? <laughs> I keep thinking of I get all these crazy images of of, uh, of things I don't I don't want to see. So <laughs> I appreciate everyone getting a handle on that. Um, quick note: uh, Commissioner Schaefer is it was able to join by phone. Laura, uh, so now I think we have both commissioners Vihill and Schaefer by phone. Um, so his I don't know Laura if you see phone numbers when people speak, but um, his is ending in five eight five four. So I'll keep my eye out for that too. And I guess Commissioner Schaefer, if you just want to text me, since you can't, and Commissioner Vihill, that same goes for you, since you can't raise your hand, either interject or send me a text and I'll keep my eye on both. Um, Commissioner Hauser, I know has a question or comment for Commissioner Greenberg. Um, well, it's somewhat of a non sequitur, especially after those topics. Um, so thank you for the work um, that the department is doing, but I am completely remiss that I didn't mention in my commissioner comments, again, sort of verging to my day job. I do want to thank um, both uh, Kate Greenberg and Heather Dugan. Um, in my day job, we are not able to host uh, in-person commencement ceremonies this year at all of our campuses, and we aligned with the 100th anniversary of, of women's suffrage and, and uh, the 19th Amendment, the women's right to vote, and had an incredible slate of women speaker, commencement speakers, um, uh, lined up for that, and we are going completely virtual um, next Friday for all those commencement, commencement speeches, and I want to say that Kate was the first one to raise her hand to say that she would toggle over to a, a virtual speech, and um, I want to say thanks to Heather as well uh, for addressing our um, uh, law enforcement graduates. Kate's going to uh, address our Steamboat Springs campus graduates. So it's just a nice way of sort of bringing in this, this uh, world to my other world. But I just want to say thanks to both of them for um, being ready to go at any possible pandemic. So anyway, my delayed commissioner comments. I'm sorry, I meant to say that earlier and it was on my list and I forgot. So thank you to Kate and to Heather.
Great. Thank you, Commissioner Hauser. And, and um, yeah, that sounds great. It's it's hard to be prepared, prepared for a pandemic that uh, we, we don't experience every <laughs> once a century. So yeah, I, I will echo. I appreciate everyone's, everyone's uh, comments and willingness to participate and step up to the plate. So um, any other questions, comments for um, Ag Department? Okay, Director Prenzo, you're on. All right, that, uh, thanks to Madam Chair, I appreciate that. Um, Deanna, if you're still on, I'm still getting lots of texts that uh, the public can't call in. So uh, I assume that's fixed now that YouTube is uh, uh, resolved. But um, so anyway, yes, I want to start off again, thanks to all the staff that's managing um, through all this uh, pandemic and extra work and uh, trying to do online, et cetera. Also the commission, I, I fully get that uh, would be nice to be in person and nobody liked that more than me. So it's a hard enough job that you all have to do this, let alone to try and do it um, via internet, uh, email and uh, uh, Zoom, but uh, we'll do the best we can. So again, thanks. I always uh, appreciate everybody pulling together in that one direction. So I thought I'd spend just a minute or two on a couple of our wigs from the governor. Wig number one is sustainable funding for parks and wildlife. Uh, the goal is to conduct a study to establish a baseline on outdoor familiarity with Colorado Parks and Wildlife and develop a plan to engage those specific groups to increase revenues uh, by 2020, uh, Jan, June 30, 2020. Uh, most recently for our study with the consulting company Cactus about increasing CPW's relevance, we identified some message areas we wanted to test. Uh, we did shift some gears from doing in-person focus because of COVID-19. Uh, the focus group findings are feeding into an online survey for further message testing. And the final project step is for Cactus to provide us with an engagement plan we will use to build our relevancy and engage specific groups. Uh, this will wrap up in June and we'll plan on sharing the results uh, to the commission this summer. And uh, thanks to Katie and her staff and everybody working on that project. Um, week number three, increased public access. Uh, you've heard a lot uh, about that here recently, but in January, I mentioned that CPW and the land board staff had identified state trust lands to add an additional 200, I think, and 15,000 acres by September of 2020. That final list will come before you today or tomorrow morning and be presented by Brad Henley and, and Krista Heiner. And Brad and his staff and, and Zach Speezy have been working part in that with our partners, the land board. So thanks for them on that. Um, if you had a chance to look at your email, you'll notice I sent you a copy of a letter. I'm hopeful that the uh, editor of the Denver Post will pick up in, um, I would say, rebuttal to an article on Sunday about our West Slope mountain lion plan. Um, I will say I was dis disappointed in the uh, kind of uh, one-sided view of the reporting. It looked a little more advocacy than reporting to me. And so we thought we would uh, as gently but firmly point that out to the Denver Post. So we'll hopefully they'll pick that up. Um, uh, and I wanted you to see a copy of that. If you have any questions or thoughts about that, you're more than welcome to call me. We're also in, gonna continue on a, a op-ed piece and last but not least, I'm going to put it on my list to go personally meet with the editorial board, if I can, of the Denver Post to see if we can kind of rectify some of the things and build a relationship as we have such a uh, generally a, well, I would say almost always a positive impact on the lives and the livelihoods of all Coloradoans. And so um, I think being able to have that discussion with the editorial board would be an important thing for our agency. So if you have any thoughts or help with that, I'd appreciate that. So moving on, um, there uh, 
is lots of discussion at the Capitol about budget. I don't want to get too specific on there, but Joint Budget Committee came up with some uh, recommendations, and I think kind of globally their recommendation is to not do anything and then hope and see what comes back. And so that I think is what, not I think, Justin is working on this afternoon, pretty draconian suggestions of what might not happen. And so we're gonna weigh in on that. And uh, I can fill you in a little lot more, but it's, since it's such a moving target, I don't wanna get ahead out of that. But um, Justin and his crack staff are on it. And last but not least, at least for me, we're continuing on our uh, trying to get um, camping back open in state parks and state wildlife areas and dispersed camping. Um, it's looking more like a little past mid-May. Um, we're a little disappointed to hear that or a lot disappointed to hear that, but uh, we don't have a firm date yet. We are talking about a a mild opening, so we wouldn't, uh, as I discussed, I think a couple of days ago, we would not open group picnic areas and group campgrounds, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but we do think it's important for us to be in the fray and be part of the solution to get people back while keeping our customers safe and our visitors safe. So we are also starting to talk about how we can open uh, up our front desk portions and visitor centers at the office. And there's lots of discussions through DNR, CDPHE, and, and the governor's office on, on how to roll that out and at what level. And so that's, we're working uh, hard to get that clarity on there for our staff and for the public who, um, you know, come to expect such good customer service that, that we provide. And, and so with that, uh, unless there's any questions for me, uh, I'll, I'll be quiet and thanks for the uh, time on the agenda, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Director Prenzlow. Um, questions, comments for the director, uh, Commissioner Garcia. Uh, yeah, thank you, Commissioner, or uh, Director, for all your work and the staff and all the work that you're doing. Uh, I did want to point out that we just, not last week, uh, voted to require fishing or hunting licenses to go into state wildlife areas. And the article that Hiking Bob did in the Colorado Springs Indy was really great uh, and thanked us for doing that and told people what a great value it would be to buy a fishing license if you want to go hike at a state wildlife area. So it looks like it might have worked. Oh, thank you. I, I You might have to forward that to me. I hadn't seen that. So um, I'll maybe chase that down if you send it to me and, and tell him I appreciate his thoughts. So thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, I think it was in, um, we get those push notifications uh, that come through, Laura, but I think they're, uh, I don't know if they're from a service, but it, it picks up all the articles that mention CPW or, or certain CPW related words. And I saw it, I saw it there. Um, I mean, I've also received public comment, you know, received public comment on both both ends of that. And I'm, I'm sure everyone else has too. So, um, you know, it's, I, I agree though. I think obviously we voted. And, and so that um, I'm excited to, to see how that rolls out. Um, one other question, any other questions? Director Prenzel, I had a question. Um, I know that Justin is working hard right now on all the budget stuff. I, I know there's usually a delay between financial numbers, um, impacts from decisions, and when we actually see that in the finances. Do you think when he gives it, when Justin gets his update tomorrow, um, when you mentioned about campgrounds still not being able to be open, and um, it just triggered me to think about our parks budget, and uh, of course May is when we really start to see those numbers um, go up for us, and we really rely on that with our budget. And I didn't know if. Justin's going to be able to start to give us some of the impacts from having to close our campgrounds um, or any other impacts we're having on our budget, or if that's going to be something we won't see for a couple more months, if you know. Um, I can take the global one. I'm sure he will have some of that, but uh, we did run, Justin did run, and I, maybe I talked about it, maybe I didn't or, or sent it out, but if, and this is specific to parks, um, Camping on wildlife areas is not income generating generally, but uh, we don't charge for that, but they might buy a fishing license to go out and camp on the properties. But uh, on the park side, it's significant uh, revenue. 
uh, increase uh, and uh, quite frankly is probably what keeps us our head above water on on the park side um, if we have no camping and we get to Memorial Day weekend, we'll have taken a $1.5 million haircut. So I suspect if we open up right prior to that, most of that will be true. Um, and if we get to July 4th without camping or continue to ratchet down on reservations, it's a three and a half million dollar haircut, which we quite frankly won't be able to sustain. So um, our Parks utilization is up. Um, and again, that's a great thing. There's no question that that is up, especially on the front range, less so on the West Slope. It's about standard on the West Slope, other than a few areas, because partly obviously it's stay at home and encouragement not to go to the to the to those mountain uh, districts. And so contrary to popular belief, most of that has been pretty effective. Um, as you can see, and as you discuss in your local community. Um, but uh, so utilization's up, but there's lots of moving targets. Lottery is significantly down. That will impact us. There are a lot of moving parts um, to believe that, you know, gosh, park utilization's up, all's going to be well, um, I think would be a uh, misnomer. So I'll, I'll make sure Justin touches that. I'm sure he's uh well i'll talk to him about it but uh i know if we don't uh, start to open up and wisely open up obviously i'll continue to say that that's back to my managed yes while keeping our customers and our staff safe but um you know there are ramifications for private business and for government we nobody's going to come bail us out so we're not a general fund agency thanks yeah i know that um is, is definitely a concern on my end and um, you know, I, don't, I know our June agenda is already packed, but something this commission is probably going to need to start talking about um, how we're going to handle that. Uh, Commissioner Hauser. Uh, thank you. Just a quick question for Director Prenslow. I'm curious, I was on another call this morning that had some Forest Service BLM folks on it um, over in the Roaring Fork Valley. I'm curious about, if you can relay to us a little bit, the decision making um, there's a lot of dispersed camping right now um, that's happening, I think, partly because, um, you know, Parks and Wildlife campgrounds are closed and others are actually are, are closed. It's pushing it into some of these er other areas and we're, we're walking into a pretty, pretty um, serious fire season. So could you just, I mean, just give us a sense of how that decision making is happening and the, you know, the kind of the cooperation with some of the other maybe federal agencies and others about how we manage this together, um, particularly given, you know, fire seasons coming regardless of a pandemic and, and just the services and the, and the personnel that might be available to fight those um, are also a little bit compromised. So just be curious if you can tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely, Commissioner Hauser. Um, I've been on several. I know Director Gibbs is on almost daily on uh, some of those calls. We are coordinating with counties, coordinating with our federal partners. Um, and uh, I know there was a discussion yesterday. I wasn't involved with that with, um, you know, potentially open up parts of Rocky Mountain National Park and, and lots of moving parts. So to, specifically to your question, dispersed camping on the Forest Service really was never closed. Nothing was closed with our federal BLM partners. Um, the, the concentrated camping on Forest Service was closed. I don't, there are, is discussion, and that's one of the, not only mine and, and Director Gibbs, but also the governor's request is that we coordinate with our federal partners. So one is not working against the other. That doesn't mean necessarily that we'll all be in perfect unison because there's different models, but we don't want to be, and I've said that before, we don't want to be part of the problem. You know, other people are opening up that's, and there are, there are rolling opening up openings now. And so um, specific to fire season, there are uh, uh, ban, fire ban closures, not really because it's red areas yet, but because of uh, potential strain on emergency services and, and personnel and, uh, you know, social distancing and all those kind of things. So I suspect what you're going to see is mid to late May, uh, the Forest Service and 
Parks and Wildlife are going to start rolling open. Um, but I, I also suspect unless we get a real wet spree, which um, quite frankly is not happening right now, that uh, I think some of the camping or fire bans will stay in effect. So um, there is, again, short answer, lots of discussion. Um, and uh, our federal partners and our county partners were a lot of discussion behind the scene. Good, glad to hear it. Commissioner McDaniel. Thank you. Um, a question for Director Brinslow. When I went through the financial materials, I know Justin's talking tomorrow, but uh, it indicated there were about $600,000 in refunds. Is that $1.5 million you were talking about um, in the parks revenue? Do you know if that is inclusive of those refunds or are we sitting more at about the $2.1 million mark or not? And I can ask this question to Justin tomorrow if, if you don't know, Dan. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Thanks, uh, Commissioner McDaniel. I'm embarrassed that I don't know the answer to that. I think that our our look was was I think total loss, but I don't I don't want to say it's compounded. So let's chase that down. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner McDaniel. Um, Commissioner Garcia. Yes, I just wanted to comment on uh, Commissioner Hauser's concern about the fire ban. Uh, are the fire issues. Uh, Clear Creek County has already instituted a fire ban. Uh, and so I would hope that Director Prenslow and Gibbs and folks uh, can work with the state to see that we do more of that because uh, our people that are, would have to fight these fires are not just slightly compromised, they're very compromised because they're also first responders. Uh, and they're doing a lot of other work that needs to be done uh, that uh, they should be doing as opposed to fighting forest fires that are created by somebody that's camping outside one of our state parks. So uh, hopefully other counties uh, have done a good job in trying to deal with COVID-19 and hopefully this is part of their plan in trying to institute fire bans as I've seen Clear Creek County do already. Great, any other questions, discussion for Director Prenslow? Okay, um, we're gonna skip Justin Rudder. Hopefully we will find time for him tomorrow. Um, I wanted to give a quick update on CLFT, which stands for Conservation Leaders for Tomorrow. Uh, Lauren Truitt and I have been talking with Zach Lowe and um, other folks at the McGraw. And actually I just had that open, so let me do my screen split thing here. Um, so I believe you guys have heard us um, talk about conservation leaders for tomorrow. I think uh, many, many people on this call and, and many people involved with, um, with the agency have been through a CLFT program. It's, it's through the Max McGraw Wildlife Foundation and it's um, a number of CPW staff are also instructors and it's just a, an incredible week-long program and um, in the past it's really been a curriculum focused on uh, people who may not have grown up with um, hunting and fishing and um, hunting for conservation and, and all of these kinds of topics and so it's a really great way to be exposed to uh, I think what a lot of people that grew up with it maybe were exposed to and and um, and it, it's just a really nice curriculum. And for me at least, and I've heard other folks say this about the program as well, it, it helped me significantly, you know, as, as we've all seen, our agendas are often stacked with regulatory agendas that relate to wildlife and relate to hunting and relate to things that we need to regulate around wildlife and hunting. And having a general understanding has helped me significantly when it comes to feeling like I have the, um, depth of knowledge that I need to make decisions that, um, that the agency needs to have made. So what we, what we did, and I, I was on a work trip in Chicago and I happened to meet with someone who, um, know, who's very involved with Max McGraw Wildlife Foundation and, and they had apparently already been talking about this. And so I just kind of got sucked into the conversation. Uh, but, but Colorado Parks and Wildlife staff and the CLFT program have already been talking about individually, is there a kind of curriculum that we can put together 
that's either a, like a one or a two day program or a couple of half days, something like that, that would be designed specifically for agency leadership, diverse partners, um, you know, call it new commissioners or even folks that are, um, I don't know, maybe even ag commissioners or other folks like that, uh, that need like a concise conceptual introduction to hunting's role in conservation, but that don't have, you know, I had to take a full week, you know, full five days to, to be involved with that program. And so uh, CLFT has been, has put together a, a sample outline and they're working with Lauren on making sure that 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 curriculum could match what CPW's agenda um, and see if there's a way that it could also complement a commissioner onboarding or commissioner orientation type schedule. And, and you know, I don't I don't need to take the time today to go through the proposal and agenda that CLFT has uh, offered. And, and Lauren Truitt, if you're on the line, you're, you're welcome to jump in. I don't want to get too detailed into it certainly open to questions and, and discussion, but I just wanted to give that update because I know um, I know it helped me a lot. I think obviously it wouldn't be, I don't know that it would be a mandatory part of every commissioner orientation, but I think it would be a really great opportunity to pull together some of the things that we learn in the wildlife management course, some of the things that we learn in Conservation Leaders for Tomorrow, um, and some of the things we learn in commissioner orientation and kind of package it all together. And, and it could also go out to, you know, maybe even other folks in the leadership team or even other complementary agencies like DNR and, and some of those. So just wanted to give an update that um, we have been ha those we've been having those conversations behind the scenes and think it would be a great benefit to um, this commission as well as others. Lauren, do you do you have anything to um, add to that? I don't know if Lauren's on the line. She may not be. I'm gonna assume I covered it. <laughs> all right, Lauren, well, if you come back later and wanna to add to that, feel free. Um, but that's really all I had on that. Any commissioner questions for, for what that program's about and um, any sort of comments on whether that sounds good or whether uh, you want me to cease and desist. Not seeing anything. Um, okay. Great. Well, I think we're a little ahead of schedule, which is I always love to be about 20 minutes. Priya, are you on the line and are you ready um, to do your presentation, even though we're a bit ahead of time? Hi there. Um, yeah, I can I can go ahead. If you all are uh, don't need a break. <laughs> No, go ahead. I think we'll do a break after you and then um, we can jump into agenda item 10 after that. So welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, uh, oh, I just got a text from Lauren. Um, no worries. I'll text with her and she can comment later. But thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate having you on and take it away. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair and the members of the commission. I appreciate the time on the agenda to present about the North American model of wildlife conservation. Um, I think is, let's see, Lauren, are you running the slides from your end or am I sharing my screen? I should have probably figured that I one out. I think either Laura Porter or Katie Lanter oh, Laura, would be oh, help, yeah. uh, helping to get the slides going. Yeah. We had talked about it and, and you had said you wanted to do that. So, but I can, if you'd like me okay. to. Okay, I can, I can do it either way, whatever. Yeah. If you wanna share your screen, we can okay. do that. Let's do that. All right, let me get it ready. Okay, can you all see this? Great, yes, we see your screen. I see your screen. Okay. I'm assuming everyone else does too. All right, great. Um, let's see here. Apologize, just apologies, just bear with me one more moment here. Um, no problem. We certainly understand. <laughs> And also Priya, while you're getting going, commissioners, we do have an email from Jeff Versteeg um, just before the commission meeting uh, that, that compliments 
Kriya's presentation as well. So just wanted to bring your attention to that. Okay, apologies here. And there's just a little something freezing up here, of course, on my computer right as we're starting. Um, okay, let's see, there we go. Okay, can you all see that still? Yep. Yeah, you're on. All right, great. So uh, thank you again, Madam Chair and uh, the members of the commission for allowing me to have some time on the agenda to present on this topic. Um, I was asked to present on this topic because of some uh, past work that I've done in this realm while I was uh, employed with the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. Uh, I was there from um, 2008 until 2018, and now I'm currently the Director of Conservation, or, sorry, the Director of Operations at Conservation Science Partners, uh, which is based in Fort Collins. And some of the work that I did was looking at how the North American model of wildlife conservation could be applied to other uh, wildlife uh, groups, especially those that have a user community that may have an interest in the animals and in, in, uh, harvest of those animals for different reasons. Um, and so I was a co-author on this Wildlife Society technical review um, from 2012, and that was part of the, uh, part of the reason for um, being invited to present to you today. So the North, American uh, the North American model, as I'll call it for short, is something that is basically the, the foundation of our user pay system that we have now, where basically an animal, a wild animal cannot be removed from the wild without some sort of permit or license or other fees that are paid. Um, and part of the principle behind that is to um, create value for wildlife while they're alive and to create um, a, a better way of managing the, the harvest and the sustainability of um, the resource. The model is really a uh, construct of many different laws and a program framework and research, uh, scientific research that has evolved over time. And it was first articulated by Valerius Geist in 1995 and some subsequent publications um, since then. And, but what this, what really happened was early on in um, the early 1900s, there was um, the policies that were related to game management were primarily around the commercial markets that were happening around wildlife and um, in part to, to maintain those commercial markets. Um, and this is the type of thing that was also a problem in, in Europe and that led to um, the, dimin the uh, diminishing populations of wildlife in, in Europe um, and was something that then became a, a, uh, a construct that only allowed wildlife to be available to um, those in uh, upper classes and those of the aristocracy. And so this is a, um, this image here is from the Gentleman's Gazette, which is a European publication. And um, sorry, I'm having another technical difficulty here and just loading my notes. Um, let's see here. So the Gentleman's Gazette, a, this is a European publication, as I mentioned, um, and as you'll, you'll note here, the, the dress of all of the people shown in the image here. And so basically, you know, traditionally the benefit of um, a tr traditionally hunting was done um, in Europe by the upper classes. Um, 
And I'm gonna read a little quote here from the Gentleman's Gazette. So traditionally the benefit of owning property meant the right to hunt and, uh, the, sorry, traditionally the benefit of owning property meant the right to hunt. And rather than living on someone else's land, the noblest men would seek out their own estates. Hunting has for the most part been a recreational sport since the Assyrian Kings hunted lions from their chariots. As royals, they believed any land within their kingdom was their entitled property. And so hunting was also a way for the nobility to demonstrate dominance over their people. As game moved away from inhabited lands, forests became known as hunting reserves and royals would mount their steeds with a hound beside them, tread into the reserve. And as the 12th century came about, gamekeepers were charged with monitoring the big game populations in the forests and smaller games in the warrens. Despite hunting being a sport enjoyed by all demographics, England decided to regulate it due to the dwindling numbers of wildlife and those without status of nobility were no longer hunting, but poaching and therefore were subject to severe punishment by the courts. It became a stylized pastime of the aristocracy and an, an arena for fellowship as well as military training. Hunting was no longer a right, but a privilege and a me measurement of one's class. And so you, again, you can see here in, by the dress of, of the uh, people pictured here, this was, this was very much um, about uh, status and class. There's no camo here to be seen. And that's still um, part of the tradition in, in Europe. And of course, what happened there in Europe um, is what started to happen here in the US and in Canada. Um, part of the draw that brought people to um, North America was the abundance of, of resources and, and that perception of, um, of plenty. And what it led to, and as you can see there with the bison in the upper right, um, where we had these uh, you know, millions and millions of bison across the country, but over time with the commercial markets and the market demand, um, the populations dwindled and uh, we still see the results of that today. Um, although we have some recovery that's beginning to happen now. But you can see there on the bottom left, a uh, picture that many of you may have seen in other presentations, just how the tragedy of the commons and, and how individuals working in their own self-interest um, could really wreak havoc on populations. And it's, it's, um, it's almost unfathomable to think about the number of skulls that are, are shown there in this picture. Um, and so one of the important parts of the, of the model is the idea of being able to regulate the harvest of animals and to also uh, regulate um, these markets on wildlife um, and eliminate them in, in certain cases in order to allow for population recovery. Um, but the regulated markets are one of the key points of the model. And this is a part of the part of the issue that allowed the tragedy of the, tragedy of the commons to become a triumph of the commons, as Valerius Geist also noted in his 1995 publication. And sportsmen really are um, the champions of this model, allowing that regulated use would keep animals available for, for hunting and for personal uses. So we have the seven principles of the models, the model here, um, just listed out for a moment so you can take a look and I'll go through those one by one briefly. So the first principle is the idea that wildlife is a public trust resource. Um, this is the idea that wildlife is owned by no one unless it is physically possessed. And the only way to possess an, uh, a wild animal is with a license or a permit or other permission to remove this, the animal from the wild and to possess it. Again, it sets up this framework for our user pay system. And another key component of the public trust doctrine is that state uh, fish and wildlife agencies are the uh, primary entities with jurisdiction over how wildlife, um, uh, how those licenses and permits are, uh, are determined and allocated. 
something that this commission is obviously very familiar with. So the second principle is the elimination of markets for wildlife. Um, and as mentioned, because of the, the massive um, uh, decline in populations due to the commercial demand, there was an elimination of the markets, but a regulation of certain commercial markets um, to allow for certain uses. And the idea behind this again was so that wildlife would have a value when alive and that when there was a reason to, to harvest an animal, it was, um, it was for a legitimate purpose or that there was, there were tight regulations and controls around them. Um, so for example, game and bird species, we don't generally commercialize those unless they are captive bred. An example of that is if you buy venison at a restaurant or um, in other, some other sort of market, those are captive reared or, or farmed animals. Um, same thing with ducks uh, that you, if you order a duck breast at the restaurant, that's from a, that's a farmed animal. It's not one that was captured from the wild. Um, and so there's uh, then the other aspect of the elimination of markets was to have the, uh, the uh, tightly regulated markets as one way to, to maintain the sustainability. One classic example of the regulated markets is the American alligator. Um, when the convention on the international um, trade on endangered species or CITES and the Endangered Species Act were enacted in the 70s, this was one of the animals that was first listed in both of those um, laws, those federal laws. And the tight regulation in, in collaboration with the states, the tight regulation on the markets for meat and hides and eggs is what was responsible for the recovery. And, and that's really been a recovery that has occurred in just recent years where now we have um, abundant populations in the Southeastern United States and hunting is now being allowed for these species um, by uh, more for recreational purposes, but again, still tightly rec uh, regulated. There's a lot of similarities with this to our fur bearers. And uh, that's another example of where um, you have an exception to the elimination of markets and to have the tightly regulated markets. And this is something that is um, highly regulated. It serves its conservation purposes and where the, the user community, the, the trappers themselves have been supporting the sustainability of, of fur bear harvest and, and uh, related habitat conservation as well. The third principle is the idea of the allocation of wildlife by law. Um, this idea is based on the um, kind of going against the idea of supply and demand and that if there is surplus wildlife, um, in other words, what is beyond what the population needs to persist, that that can be allocated by law and not by any sort of demand or market, de market demand or by land ownership. Um, it, is, it is allocated by law and, and by those particular entities with jurisdiction. And in this case, in, in North America, it's the, the state and provincial fish and wildlife agencies that makes that determination. The fourth principle is the idea that wildlife can be killed, can only be killed for legitimate purpose. So harvesting and removal of wild animals must be for those, those types of legitimate purposes such as food, skins and pelts, self-defense or property protection. For game species and non-game birds, this was a big part of ensuring and restoring populations um, for example, with non-game birds, there was a large, um, uh, again, more of the privileged class, a demand for feathers for the fashion industry at the time. And with the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and, and other regulation, um, now harvesting those animals without a permit or license is prohibited by law. It also helped to um, protect those animals that uh, were moving between countries. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, 
And so that leads me to this fifth principle of wildlife being considered as an international resource. Um, again, relates to the concepts of migratory bird management and was expanded into international commerce. And thinking about the idea that as animals move, as in migratory species across jurisdictions, that what happens in one jurisdiction affects the ability to manage the wildlife in other jurisdictions. So with migra migratory birds, um, there's a lot of collaborative efforts that happen internationally with other countries so that um, during other times of the year, uh, there's uh, cooperation on how the animals are managed um, so that the populations are not uh, harmed when they return to jurisdictions in the United States. And similarly with international commerce, this helped with, again, with CITES and some of these other international laws that um, help to regulate the, the commerce in these animals um, to ensure that the, um, that the wildlife populations remain sustainable. This principle has also been applied to cross-boundary collaboration among states. So with other migratory po populations with some of our big game species, you know, whether it be elk or pronghorn or um, other animals that may just move across boundaries even at very small scales. Um, one, of, one example that is currently happening um, with respect to management of, of species across boundaries, both international and across state boundaries are with turtle exports and, and turtle uh, commercial turtle harvest. Um, this is something that I was working on uh, a bit, but just as I just wanted to quickly note this as another sort of non-traditional example uh, of where the model can be helpful in that there is a large international trade in turtles um, in part because Asian native turtles have been harvested nearly to extinction, um, in great part due to demand for food, um, but also for the pet trade. And because of that extirpation in their native ranges, they have been, um, those countries have been trying to source wild turtles from other parts of the world. And the United States happens to have a, the largest turtle population, one of the largest turtle populations in, um, in uh, North America, the largest number of species, I should say. Um, and so the regulation now of the harvest of these species and the export of these, um, of certain turtle species is, has become um, an area of focus um, outside of the sort of game world. And it is one of these next uh, or current examples of the tragedy of the commons. Um, that a lot of folks in, in um, non-game man, man, non management are trying to get their hands around. So the sixth principle is science is the proper tool for discharge of wildlife policy. This is based on Leopold's American game policy and principles in, in game management. And the idea here is that regulations and laws are informed by the best available science and information um, knowing that that information is ever evolving, that wildlife management is based on changing knowledge and numbers of licenses and harvest report information, changing habitat conditions, habitat availability and quality and principles of adaptive management, and et cetera. Last but not, not least is the democracy of hunting. This is the idea that the opportunity for hunting uh, applies to all. It, it has nothing to do with class or status and allows for uh, people to hunt or use wildlife in the public trust. And when applied more broadly, it includes the act of seeking or finding or viewing wildlife um, in the wild and the ability to, to continue to have that access. Also, when applied generally, it, it includes favoring wise, well-regulated use over bans. And so this is again with the principle of, of access to the wildlife, um, the ability to regulate harvest and allow for that sort of uh, democratic process of, of making um, uh, the wildlife available under these other principles allocated by law and determined by um, uh, the, the agencies with jurisdiction and, and considering it uh, all within the public trust and, and ensuring that it's available for all. And finally, another piece of this is transparency and clarity of the laws for use. 
So in other words, the clear laws, when, when the laws are very clear and clearly articulated, laws and regulations should not discourage legal hunting practices and, and should not inadvertently uh, result in, in poaching or breaking of, of laws when they're, when they're clearly articulated. And so with that, I think there may be a little bit of time for questions or, um, and if, if so, I'd be happy to take any. Certainly, I think, <clears throat> thank you so much. And here, let me start my video again. I was trying to maintain bandwidth, make sure I didn't cause any sort of, um, make sure that everyone has plenty of bandwidth here. Um, one of the things and my, I apologize, I didn't, catch all this on the emails and um, you know obviously with various different emails coming through Priya I apologize I wanted to do kind of an introduction read your bio <laughs> you know give a little more background before you started and I um, somehow I missed that so my apologies and so I just want to kind of highlight a few of those things um, mainly thank you so much for that update because Commissioners will probably notice recently we've been hearing more and more, not just from staff in their presentations, but also from some of our citizen petitioners and some of our constituents and folks more and more about reference to the North American model. Um, and so really having an understanding of what are the principles, where did it come from, why do we have a model, the history, the content, the background is really helpful. Um, and I just wanted to it, reading reading someone's bio after the fact, I apologize, uh, it may not be as great, but if you'll allow me, I would really, it's really impressive. So um, hopefully <laughs> hopefully we can get through it, uh, the awkwardness, and you'll let me go ahead and, and read. So he is currently the Director of Operations for Conservation Science Partners, which you already mentioned, um, out of Fort Collins, and with ba a bachelor's and a master's degrees in biology with emphasis in wildlife ecology and conservation. So certainly background here and what we need to know. Um, 20 years experience in wildlife conservation and policy. And prior to Conservation Science Partners, um, Priya spent 10 years with Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. Uh, of course, we all know, um, I think we're all familiar with them, the entity that coordinates among state fish and wildlife agencies across North America. And where her work centered on wildlife conservation and invasive species management policy. The particular area of focus for her was looking at how the North American model of wildlife conservation could be broadly applied to other wildlife species and creating related guidance documents for state fish and wildlife agencies. Her work included serving as a national state agency's coordinator for partners in amphibian and reptile conservation, an organization that honored her with a visionary leadership award in 2019. Uh, Priya was recently confirmed by the Colorado State Senate Committee on, on Agriculture and Natural Resources to serve on the Habitat Stamp Committee, um, appointed by Governor Polis, and has a seven-year-old daughter, who I think we may be heard at the beginning there, uh, with whom she loves her shares her love of, of wildlife and, and outdoor recreation and i just want to say thank you for serving on the habitat stamp committee I, I also served on that as did commissioner schaefer and um it's an incredibly demanding and important role so thank you for that um i, I wanted i know that there are commissioner comments and questions but i just wanted to bring up one point uh with regard to i think it was number two um with regard to the exception for amphibians and fur bears. And I just wanted to thank you for pointing out how that's how that's a little different. And I just had it up here. Um, and so I think there might be some questions and, and comments discussion around that. Um, the, you know, the the second, which was markets are for game are eliminated. Um, and it, and again, just really helpful to have that history and perspective. So any commissioner uh, or, or even or staff um, questions, discussion around um, North American model? Commissioner Vigil, are you, I see your name, but I, I can't tell if you have a yes, comment. Yes, ma'am, that, that's me that just unmuted myself. Oh, good, okay. And I, and I, I do have a comment and uh, a question for Priya. Uh, first of all, I, I want to thank you, Priya, for the presentation. It's, it, this is terrific. I wish I would have had this eight years ago when I joined this commission. Uh, but anyhow, my question is, uh, are there other countries in the world that, that have something similar to our North American model? 
because it has been so successful in Canada and Colorado, it would seem like this could be a worldwide use of a model for all a bunch of countries. Yeah, you know, I think um, I was looking into this a little bit and um, one of the things that makes us unique is the way that the jurisdiction around wildlife management policy falls to the states. Um, in many other countries, it's more of national policies or federal policies that, that govern their wildlife management. And um, some of that in part is, is also related to um, histories in those countries of um, that sort of, you know, uh, uh, common um, property type uh, approach where, you know, people in their own self-interest, whether it's for food or for, uh, for other reasons are, you know, hunting as needed what's available on their properties. But um, we are, we are North America. And, and when I say North America, I should clarify that it's really just the U.S. and, and Canada that we're talking about. Um, Mexico is definitely um, in conversation with us in these different uh, policies, but they are um, approaching it um, you know, really, they've really been kind of taking a look at their their wildlife management policies more recently. Um, so it's still kind of evolving. Um, but I think we are very unique in, in the way that we we manage at that state level. Um, and uh, that it started fairly early on. Um, and, and another key point, you know, there is, is just the ways in which um, not just the elimination of markets, but the regulation of markets allowed for the recovery of so many wildlife species, um, such that we have now what you know people when they come from other countries would consider such a, abundant wildlife resources, and that really is a testament to the ways in which we've we've managed you know from that perspective of of public trust and sustainability. Um, so yeah, I don't know if I fully answered that question, but I, I think generally we're pretty, uh, you know, most um, people would say that it's it's without parallel um, in other parts of the world. Very good, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I, I wish more countries would adopt something like that or uh, at least portions of countries would do that. Yeah, and I, I somebody had asked me um, whether this is something that that countries are, are trying to adopt now. I, I don't know for certain, but I think in, again, in part because of the depletion of resources in most other countries, the ability to manage in the same way that we do is, is sort of not possible. Um, but there, there probably are some analogs in, in certain parts of, I, I would imagine in certain parts of Africa, uh, again, though at the national level, I think um, in most cases, but, um, yeah, I think uh, I think you're right. We we have a pretty great model um, for people to emulate. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Thanks, Commissioner Vihill. Uh, Commissioner Haskett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Priya. That was a great presentation. I really appreciate that. Um, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, since all this started, um, really over a hundred years ago. Do you think it's still relevant today and that the principles and practices still apply? I, I do, you know, I think that when uh, the basics of game um, management, you know, began, um, again, as I, I mentioned um, in the early history of the country, it was more to manage towards those markets, but as um, those market interests, you know, clearly were going beyond what um, what could be supported sustainably. Uh, the need for better regulation um, came about, and I think we we see that we have to continue to evolve um, with the specifics of how we manage wildlife. As um, you know, again, as as habitat changes and availability and um, human populations, you know, as we move into different parts of, um, of, you know, move into spaces that are, uh, that have been occupied by wildlife. And so just the, 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 the specifics of how wildlife are managed, um, continue to evolve and change. And I think that's, this model is a, it's a flexible framework, 
you know, and, and each state with their own pressures, um, you know, has the ability to, to manage as they see fit with the, you know, with the jurisdiction following to the state agencies. Um, but there is the ability um, to have this um, relatively uniform approach, which also contributes to law enforcement. And so some, some of you, or maybe all of you would be familiar with the wildlife, uh, interstate wildlife violator compact. And so the idea that when um, someone has broken a wildlife law in one state, you know, could be uh, held accountable in another state or, you know, their privileges could be lost uh, for hunting in another state because of that violation. Um, the Lacey Act actually also um, it, of 1900, um, that interstate commerce violation was one of the key principles there um, in terms of federal laws that was, were also sort of supporting these ideas. And uh, as part of that within the Lacey Act, there's also the, um, the, the support of um, enforcing state laws, you know, when they are, you know, crossing for, uh, boundaries. And um, as I was mentioning, you know, thinking about some of these other groups of wildlife that maybe have been um, maybe a little bit more attention is, is coming to them now. Um, my area of expertise has been on uh, amphibians and reptiles and, and looking at how those markets, um, there are still commercial markets for some of those. And so I think there are some, some newer areas of how those, how the model can be applied. Um, but yeah, I think that's a, a bit of a long-winded winded answer to say that I think that there's still um, a lot of, of relevance today. It, it has evolved and shifted in terms of the specifics of, of you know, what is most relevant now, but I think that it, it, um, it is still a, a viable model. And, and uh, as you'll see in some of these publications that have come out recently talking about it, there's, there's kind of a renaissance that's happening right now where agencies are sort of recognizing that, that value and trying to um, have you know, more discussions on, on uh, what, if anything, um, needs to be done differently. And, but having these states you know, talking to each other about how they can um, work together on any such um, changes or, or differences in interpretation of the model. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Commissioner Haskett. Uh, Commissioner Garcia. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation and for all the work that you're doing. I, I was reminded as I was listening when looking at these slides of uh, a book that I keep nearby, Meditations on Hunting by Jose Ortega, you got that. And I was wondering if you ever spend time looking, because we get a lot in our citizens coming to us talking about the ethics and, and sort of the morals of hunting. Uh, if you, if the model uh, and you delve more into sometimes looking at those kind of issues, which are becoming probably, uh, you know, when we looked at back when market hunting, uh, a lot of that had to do with um, the economy and those sort of things, uh, more practical approaches than uh, ethical type of approaches, uh, that, although they were surrounded, in, I'm sure, by ethics. But I, I just wondered if, if you look at, at something like that and how we apply sort of the ethics and when, as we go through the model and man's just nature uh, in being a hunter. That's a, that's a great question. Um, and and uh, you know, there's, there's a lot sort of wrapped up in there, but I think the basic idea or principle that would apply there is, is wildlife being killed for a legitimate um, purpose. Um, you know, again, whether it is for um, subsistence for food or for skins and pelts, um, you know, or uh, in that sort of, or for the recreational um, purposes, as long as it's within those limits and done in, you know, with the particulars um, in terms of the methods that are considered appropriate. And that would of course, you know, be things that the commission would um, be considering um, uh, or the agency in, in certain states, um, you know, some of those decisions fall to the agency. And so um, to the, uh, so I think 
it's a it's an important question and it's probably one that continues to come up and and probably as um new um you know whether it be technology or um tools that people you know think about to use for the purposes of hunting you know um those kinds of questions are gonna evolve and change as those different methodologies and and um and issues arise um but I think that particular principle helps to kind of wrap that together so that it allows for that consideration. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Commissioner McDaniel. Hello Priya, that's um, just an outstanding um, description of the North American model. Uh, I think is very helpful and I'm really glad that we broadcast that to the public today. Uh, for many people to understand how we come about with some of the rules and uh, principles that we use in, in everyday wildlife management. Um, to Commissioner Garcia's comment, you know, one of the things I think about um, in terms of the basics around ethics is the North American model helped bring about, I call it the concept of fair chase, as it moved from commercial to more recreational hunting, including um, the requirement of consumption of the resource as well, you know, it brought about, um, you know, agencies moving forward for, you know, being careful. We had hunting during breeding seasons, uh, you know, not hunting in seasons where wildlife are rearing their young, uh, really set the basis for how we set seasons and limits and, and so forth. And, and um, anyway, I don't know if it was part of thinking about the North American model or just an outcome from it, but I think it really helps the agency think forward about how you know true conservation of resource comes about with uh, you know careful use of it as well as it moved from market to uh, recreational hunting. Thank you. I don't know if you have any comments about that, but thank you. No, I think that's a great point. But yeah, I, I don't have further comments on that. But thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McDaniel. Commissioner Adams. think this model is a really important one. And my question is more around just growth opportunities that you're seeing within the models. So obviously things are changing, uh, not even just the great pause, but one example is just the de decline in hunters uh, across the country. Um, and also just rec the recognition that it's not just wild, the management of wildlife, but the management of people interacting with wildlife. So my question is really around the role of social sciences um, as a, a um, in this work and coupling it with the biological and earth sciences? And is that something that has been, um, that has been a discussion topic for you and your, your colleagues? Um, so that's an acute question, but then just more broadly, um, where are the opportunities to strengthen um, or address any gaps? Yeah, th thank you so much. That's a great question. And I think, um, is definitely an area of growth uh, that's happening in general in wildlife management. Um, you know, there's the social sciences, human dimensions, you know, those are, those are issues that are um, becoming more and more relevant and important um, to consider in, in these issues. And again, as I was mentioning, you know, as um, the population grows or as, um, areas of land change because of, you know, the way that, that people are occupying it and the, the interactions that, that come about, but also just the successes that we've had in, in wildlife restoration, um, where certain um, animals may be more abundant and more um, prevalent. Um, one example there is I have, a, I have an aunt who lives in Florida and she, she keeps complaining to me about all how all the alligators keep coming up in her backyard. And, you know, I mean, but it's a, it's a great success story. Um, from a wildlife management perspective. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I am not a social scientist um, at Conservation Science Partners. We just brought a, so, a social scientist onto our staff. And uh, so it's something that we think about um, and that I'm really excited about, you know, working on some of those types of questions, you know, with her. But um, we are, I, I think in general, the, the fish and wildlife conservation community is, is recognizing that and is, is um, looking into you know the ways in which that impacts our our, our policies and our our management, um, 
but it's it's still pretty early in, in those phases. But I, I definitely, you know, even when I was with the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, that was a an area that was um, really getting a lot more attention um, and, and has been getting more um, consideration in the last uh, probably um, five, five or so years, I'd say. Awesome, thank you, I appreciate that. And any um, gaps or growth opportunities, I know there's been some conversation around even revisiting Pittman Robinson to expand to include optics and scopes and all of the other things, but just curious if there, and even in response to the great pause, if things have come up um, as opportunities to address any kind of gaps or build on any strengths in the model. Yeah. Again, that's a great question. I, I'd say I'm, um, uh, less of a, an expert in that particular realm. I think there's, you know, it's always important to look at what, you know, what can be done to um, uh, consider, you know, especially when we're talking about Pittman, Robert, Pittman Robertson or Dingle Johnson in terms of the, the sources of funding, you know, for managing our, our wildlife. And um, I'm uh, assuming that most of you have heard of the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, which is kind of the, the other side of of the um, uh, the other opportunity that we have out there to potentially get you know more funding for the non-game side of, of wildlife, um, uh, primarily, but also would you know apply in a lot of cases to the to um, our fish and game species as well. Um, so I think yeah, I mean I think there's there's been a lot of conversation. Just the fact that the Recovering America's Wildlife Act is out there in Congress is um, an example of these, um, the thought processes that are happening and the, the interest in, in looking at other opportunities to, to raise funding and to, you know, to grow um, the model in ways that can allow for this sustainable management um, because all of this, you know, can't be done without the funding. And I, I uh, didn't really emphasize it, but I should have that uh, a big part of all of this is law enforcement and, um, you know, um, when it, it, talking about, for example, the turtles um, that I was mentioning is, is like a, a new area of tragedy of the commons right now. Part of the issue is that um, you can get a whole lot of turtles in one small area. And if you don't have somebody watching them, they can get just completely scooped out, you know, of an area. Um, but that's a, that's a tricky thing in terms of um, funding, you know, and staffing, you know, for, for wildlife management or for law enforcement, I should say. Um, so anyway, those are, those are, you know, a couple of ideas that come to mind from that. But yeah, I think there's, there's always a lot of room for, for growth and discussion. In, in those areas. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Commissioner Adams. Um, I don't see any other hands raised right now, but of course, feel free and uh, we'll have to thank Justin for giving us this extra time on the agenda to have this conversation because I do think this is really important. Um, a couple of things I wanted to bring up and then I think D Director Prenzel also had a couple of comments. Um, main thing was, I, I, well, one thing I really wanted to thank you for, <laughs> when you see venison or elk on the menu and you read the, um, you know, just the seven principles, I really appreciate you explaining why that's okay <laughs> that you can you can have you can go to a restaurant and have um, an elk burger and and how that works. So um, thanks for explaining that. Uh, one of the things I wanted to point out that these principles, these seven principles, if you recall, a few years ago, a number of the commissioners attended it, along with um, um, Luis Benita. I just completely spaced on. Luis Benitez <laughs> joined us at the SHIFT conference, which was a group, it, it's, SHIFT was in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and it st stands for Shifting How We Invest for Tomorrow. And there was a subgroup, um, kind of a, a, a round table on, I think it was land and water, wildlife conservation, that kind of thing. And from that came this incredible energy, at, at least to Colorado, and I'd love to see other states do this, to talk about how we can create our own set of principles um, much like the principles from the North American model. So we created in Colorado, we put together a lot of these groups and Director Prenzel can talk more about this because he was very involved. Uh, principles for, out, for advancing outdoor recreation and conservation. And those are on our website. Um, if anybody wants to quickly Google that, it's um, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, Principles for Advancing Outdoor Recreation and Conservation. And it was really focused on um, how do we 
take these principles that work for hunting and fishing and be and and understanding the history of why we created these principles the fact that we needed to we were going to completely lose all these species if we didn't put something in place and applying it to recreation and understanding that again we're in this conundrum again where if we don't start to manage how we're utilizing the resource we're going to put ourselves in a bind where we where we can't enjoy the resource the way we want to. Um, and so we, we put together these principles for recreation and conservation um, around resource management specific to how, to how Colorado works. And I just, I wanted to bring everyone's attention to that because I just thought it was really interesting, really neat how, when we talk about um, recovering um, Amer America's Wildlife Act and, and ways that we can utilize this tried and true set of principles and apply it, you know, carbon copy it and apply it at, to other areas where we need this kind of help. So um, I just I, I just wanted to comment on that. Um, I also want to invite you, Priya, as as you, you know, it sounds like you're continuing to work on some really interesting things, um, hiring a social scientist, some other things, I invite you to, to keep us updated, um, you know, whether it's through communicating with Laura or um, you know, any of our staff and, and just getting that back out to the commission. I, I really invite you to keep us updated, stay involved. Um, obviously you're on the Habitat Stamp Committee, you know how to get in touch with us, uh, but I, I would really invite updates as you as you see fit. Um, Director Prenzlow, I think you had some comment or question. Thank you. Yeah, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, I might uh, take a quick hard left and say, uh, yeah, interesting as Priya discussed, I mean, North American model is not, it's all the principles, but significant part of that is about um, uh, funding model too, even though it's, and um, when we talk about the, the co-op, so we have, you know, hunting, hunting and fishing page for really all conservation. Um, OHV sticker pays for management of motorized trails. GOCO is actually paying for non-motorized trails, but uh, we have, as you all know, a big, large discussion about a backpack tax or whatever you want to call it, or a, uh, um, you know, we didn't get a lot of support from their own users on a mountain bike uh, kind of sticker, even though OHV people and, and snowmobilers said that's the best thing they ever did. It concentrated them and be able to invest funding back into their own sport for maintenance, enforcement, et cetera. So um, I, I, I think that for Commissioner Adams' question, there's a huge growth opportunity. It's outside the North American model, but a user pay and and it's a benefit not only to maintaining but to improving what you've already got on the landscape so with that what i really want to say is thanks to to priya not only for today uh, i think this was very helpful that was the intent i appreciate the suggestion um, actually i think it came from dan gates that that you know we've got enough newer commissioners and this is such a broad thing and people talk about it matter of fact i'm going to talk about it in the potential op-ed over that mountain lion issue or brought up again about uh, the North American model. So we just thought it'd be a benefit and no better to bring that to you than Priya. And I also want to thank her for her uh, dedication to the Habitat Stamp in the state of Colorado. So with that, thanks so much. Thank you very much, Director Prenzlow. I, I really appreciate it. And yeah, I, I was remiss in, in noting that uh, Dan Gates, um, you know, uh, called me up to see if I'd be willing to do this presentation and after you know talking to a couple of other folks and so I'm I'm uh, again just really um, uh, grateful to have the opportunity to to talk with you all and uh, um, but I'm glad we got through a couple of my little technical difficulties in the beginning there but uh, happy to answer other questions going forward and uh, thank you also madam chair um, with uh, inviting um, the opportunity to to reach out in the future and I, I hope uh, hope uh, that we can stay in touch that way. So thank you. Well, thanks for plugging in and we'd much rather see and hear from you than Dan Gates. So we'll just put that on the hot. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Know, so you know he's listening. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he is. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you and, and thanks everyone. That is a perfect timing to get us into a break. Um, it's 3.03, so we're gonna get a couple extra minutes. So let's come back as per the agenda at 3.20. Um, and Dion, if you don't mind, or Laura, whoever puts up the slide to say that we're on break. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.
All right, Dion, should we uh, should we jump back into things? Great. Um, Dion, I think so. I think we have been all set on the YouTube live stream for a little while. Do you want to give us a quick update on that? Yeah, the uh, the outage that we all experienced at the beginning uh, had nothing to do with OIT or CPW or Zoom for that matter. Um, there's a nationwide outage that's happening um, right now and CenturyLink is part of that and with the infrastructure that everybody relies on. Um, you're probably experiencing some of that at home. I know some of our staff and um, members of the public are. So I just wanted to report that uh, the problems we're seeing are a nationwide outage that's uh, coming and going and nothing really to do with the infrastructure that we have in place. So uh, right now we are streaming, uh, streaming live to YouTube and uh, keeping our fingers crossed. Thanks, Dion. I'm sure that makes everyone feel a little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> now I just got an interconnect, internet connections unstable warning. Come on. <laughs> um, okay, great. Well, let's jump into agenda item 10. Krista Heiner, you're up. Welcome. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good afternoon, uh, Commissioners, Executive Director Gibbs, Director Prenslow. I am Krista Heiner, Regulations Manager for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. So let's get started with agenda item 10, which is a citizen petition relating, relating to chapter W2, big game, requesting the commission allow crossbows as a method of take during the archery big game seasons. The petitioner's name is John Deckruff. He is proposing changing regulation number 203A5A, which prohibits crossbows as a legal method of take during the archery season for deer, elk, pronghorn, bear, sheep, goat, and moose. Mr. Deckruff is unable to attend, so I will briefly present his petition to you. Um, he argues if crossbows were legal during the archery season, uh, more people, including children, women, and people with disabilities who may have difficulties pulling a handheld bow would be able to hunt. He also claims that crossbows and handheld bows are similar in many regards, and that there is a nationwide trend towards legalization of crossbows during the archery season. Um, Madam Chair, the division has prepared a response to the petition. I'm not sure if the commission would like to hear that now or if there are questions I could answer first on the petition. Um. Yeah, I just stopped my video there because my it said my internet connection was unstable. Um, I don't see any hands raised, so I think yeah, let's. I'd like to hear the um, staff response, and then we can have discussion. And and just so everyone knows, on these action items, I have asked. Um, so anything on your agenda with an A has an action item is an action item, and I've asked Laura to help me um, draft the motions so that we don't have to memorize the motions. So I will be. Um, stating that on any of these action items, I'll be stating the motion and asking for someone to make said motion. So <laughs> just, just as a point of um, reference. Yeah, Krista, go ahead if we could hear staff response. Sure. <clears throat> so the division recommends denying the petition for the following reasons. The commission's regulations already allow hunters to use crossbows during the rifle season. CPW also provides accommodation permits that allow hunters with disabilities to use crossbows during the archery season if needed. Currently, CPW's regulations are designed to ensure there is a primitive season for archery. The length and date of the archery season, as well as the proportion of licenses sold over the counter, are based in part on archery hunter success rate. Because crossbows may affect that success rate, allowing hunters to use crossbows during the archery season would require the commission to revisit the season structure. Over the past 20 years, the number of archery hunters buying over-the-counter elk licenses um, has, for example, has doubled from more than 19,500 in 2002 to 44,900 in 2019. The average success rate during this time has been approximately 12%. And for large parts of Colorado, either sex of elk can be taken with an over-the-counter license during the month of September during the rut. The longer season and hunter's ability to harvest either sex um, elk is based on relatively low success rates. 
If crossbows had a positive impact on the success rate or participation, CPW would need to re-examine the archery season's length, the opportunity to offer either sex licenses, and whether those licenses could continue to be over the counter. And in fact, as you all know, CPW just limited archery hunting in four large herds for the 2020 season uh, to lower harvest on cow elk and reduce hunter crowding. Um, and with that, I'm open for any questions and discussion. Great, Krista, thank you. Um, commission discussion, um, so typically on these citizen petitions, just again, a bit of housekeeping, we, we have three options we can accept, we can dismiss, or we can give, we can have a discussion and then have consensus on direction to staff what we'd like them to do next. Uh, so given that, looks like we've got a couple hands. Commissioner Vardy. Thank you, Madam Chair. I understand and agree with the staff's recommendation. Uh, I'm curious what the response would be if crossbow was uh, explored during muzzleloader season. Krista, do you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't have uh, thoughts on that in uh, aspect in particular. Perhaps one of my colleagues uh, might be able to answer that a little bit more. Although I know the muzzle lo loader season, you know, is specifically designed for muzzle loaders. So um, it's a similar thing, I believe, to you know the regulations that are designed specifically for for archery. So um, let's see. Maybe one of my colleagues might be able to provide more answer on that. Any staff want to jump in there? Perhaps it's something we can discuss offline as needed. Sure. Yeah, let us look into that and get back to you. I didn't, sorry, I don't have that right off the top of my head. Okay, great. Sounds good. Thank you, Commissioner Vardy. Commissioner Bray. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this this isn't a new issue. I've on my tenure of the commission, I've probably seen uh, this come before us at least four different times that I can remember over the years. Uh, I think staff response is perfect. There's already mechanism to use crossbows in other seasons. Disability folks can apply to use a crossbow and uh, so the disability aspect of, of hunters is, is addressed. I, I strongly oppose uh, allowing crossbows during the archery season. I think, uh, I think they have other means to do so. And I think staff's, I support staff's recommendation 100%. Thank you. Great, thank you, Commissioner Bray. Commissioner McDaniel. Um, I would just second Commissioner Bray's comment. Uh, I know it's come before the commission before. Um, you know, having used um, long bows, recurves, compounds, crossbow, and rifle, familiar with um, every one of those weapons during a hunting season as a sportsman, and I would liken crossbows more to a rifle than than anything else. Uh, can be shot from a rest. It doesn't have a hold requirement, um, and it actually encourages. I would say longer range shooting, which is what all the ads about crossbow show today, uh, out to 100 yards, which is really, I think, you know, a pretty unethical thing to do. Uh, and to Commissioner Bray's comments, it, they are already legal. Uh, and if somebody is uh, disabled, uh, they can clearly, you know, ask the agency for uh, permission to use it in an archery season and they're legal during rifle season. So I, uh, I do also strongly oppose them being put into the archery season and support staff's recommendation. Thank you, Commissioner McDaniel. Um, I don't see any other hands or um, a phone number call in coming up on my screen. Commissioner Haskett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I agree with um, Commissioner Bray and Commissioner McDaniel. And I would like to make a motion that we um, um, decline the citizens petition. A second. This is Taisha. Great. Thank you. So we have a motion on the floor by Commissioner Haskett, second by Commissioner Adams. Um, any discussion? Oh, thank you, Commissioner Adams. I got your hand, but that, that was good. Thank you. <laughs> a little delayed on my part. Um, any discussion or um, Jake, do we need to have public comment on? I guess no, because any public comment would have to have been signed up ahead of time. Sorry. 
had to answer my own question there. Uh, any additional commission discussion before we do a roll call vote? Don't see any, don't see any text messages. Okay, uh, Laura, do you mind calling a roll? Sure. Adams? Yes, yes to deny, wait, is that right? The motion on the floor is to dismiss the citizen petition. Yes, requesting to dismiss. Our crossbows as <laughs> yes, to dismiss. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Bleka? Yes. Bray? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Haskett? Yes. Hauser? Yes. McDaniel? Yes. Schaefer? I think he is calling in. He may have to star six. My apologies, yes. Thank you. Vardy? Yes. V Hill? V Hill, yes. Chair Zimmerman? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Laura. Krista, thank you. All right. Um, so as everyone saw, we are going to jump from agenda item 10 to, whoa, iPad doing it. Okay, there we go, to agenda item 14. Um, these are non-regulatory item. This is a non-regulatory item. Jody Kennedy uh, to give us a, a presentation on the Colorado Outdoor Regional Partnerships. Sure, so I'm going to share my screen. So thank you, Madam Chair, Commissioners, Director Prenzo. This is Jody Kennedy, CPW's Public Involvement and Planning Specialist. And Dan Zimmer is going to start our presentation today. Dan, you're on mute. And uh, Jody, we can't see the slides yet. They are showing up on my screen. I see Dan. Hey, Dan, welcome. Hi. <laughs> so, Jody, uh, go down. When you choose the green share screen, then you're going to need to ch uh, choose the blue share screen as well. There you go. Good job. All right. Do you all see the PowerPoint presentation? Uh, we're seeing a Word document and a PowerPoint behind that. <laughs> okay. Let's try something different. How about that? Very good. All right, great. Okay, thanks for getting that up, Jody. And good afternoon, Madam Chair, Director Prenzlow, and members of the Commission. Uh, my name is Dan Zimmer, and I'm the Statewide Partnership Coordinator with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And I was glad to hear the earlier conversation about future funding and uh, the outdoor principles that you mentioned, uh, Madam Chair, and what we're gonna talk about today relates to that. Um, I'd like to start out first with a brief story from one of our partners, which illustrates the potential for successful outcomes that this regional partnerships initiative can provide. Over the past few years, recreational use on the Slate River near the town of Crested Butte has increased substantially and it's led to intensified additional concerns uh, about habitat protection, water quality, commercial use, and the protection of private property rights. With the help from uh, grant funds and successive years from our partners in the outdoors program, the Crested Butte Land Trust convened a collaborative working group made up of multiple stakeholders representing diverse interests. Uh, and and they, they came together and they identified and addressed river specific management opportunities. Uh, initial product of that, of that collaboration was the Slate River Floating Management Plan. And the plan focused on upholding the ecological values of the area while also providing sustainable outdoor recreation opportunities. Um, and the management, management solutions were varied. They included um, interpretive signage at river access points, staffing river access points for educational purposes. Um, one thing I'd like to focus on is they, they did publicize a voluntary no float period. And what that did is it prevented disturbance to what was believed to be or is believed to be one of the highest great blue heron rookeries in the country. And these are just a few details from this community based effort 
that is providing a balanced approach to managing the unique resource in the Crested Butte Valley. And it's opportunities like this that the Colorado Outdoor Partnership sees with the Outdoor Regional Partnerships initiatives that, that my colleague Jody Kennedy and I are gonna talk about today. Jody, if you could advance the slide. Thank you. Um, I realize we have spoken to the commission previously about the Colorado Outdoor Partnership, but I wanted to provide a bit of context prior to transitioning to our plans related to the Outdoor Regional Partnerships Initiative. This group, also known as the Co-op, was convened to bring together diversity leaders from across the state to explore the following question. How do we advance and balance both outdoor recreation and conservation in Colorado? And it was clear that the coalition was concerned with what Colorado will look like in the future. And they've had a desire to ensure that the abundance and diversity of wildlife species, our stunning landscapes and world-class recreational opportunities are available for future generations. Uh, the co-op members include 30 plus organizations and agencies representing interests across the entire spectrum uh, of the outdoors, including uh, recreation, conservation, agriculture, and natural resource management industries in Colorado. Jody, if you could advance the slide, thank you. Um, in support of the vision statement that you see here, uh, the co-op abides by the Colorado Outdoor Principles, and they believe that a collaboration of leaders across the state must innovate together to ensure our private and public lands remain viable to support our diverse wildlife, outdoor recreation and agriculture heritage, and economic well-being. And to do this, the, the co-op has two firm commitments. One is to promote the importance and stewardship of our public and private lands and waters with a special emphasis on habitat conservation and outdoor recreation. And then number two, to supporting, improving, and strengthening public and private funding to conserve these shared priorities. Uh, so with this background, I do want to hand it over to Jody Kennedy now, who's going to dig into some of the details of the Outdoor Regional Partnerships Initiative. Thank you, Dan. So again, I'm Jody Kennedy, CBW Public Involvement and Planning Specialist, Madam Chair, Commissioners, and Director Prinzo. Thanks for this opportunity to present today. So Dan Zimmer's story reflects a growing challenge for communities across our state. In response, coalitions are forming to bring diverse interests together to find solutions for conserving our natural resources while meeting the growing demands for outdoor recreation. This is especially true in our mountain communities. This slide features several such efforts. Um, while there are many more, this slide highlights a couple, including coalitions in Chafee, Gunnison, Route Counties, and NOCO Places, which join several counties on the Northern Front Range. CBW and the Department of Natural Resources have been working with the Colorado Outdoor Partnership to develop a statewide framework to connect these existing coalitions in a manner that supports the individual and uniqueness of Colorado's diverse communities. To do this, we are looking at several similar statewide collaborative models, including CPW's Habitat Partnership Programs and Colorado's Water Basin Roundtables. Colorado's Outdoor Regional Partnerships Initiative has three primary goals. First is conserving our wildlife, lands, and waters while providing for outstanding opportunities for outdoor recreation. Second is creating a regional framework that connects community efforts and a statewide vision where regional partnerships share resources and lessons learned and where we advance opportunities for collaboration across interest areas and jurisdictional boundaries. And third, to develop a shared strategy that identifies local and statewide priorities to help inform and advance efforts to establish long-term sustainable funding for the outdoors. This slide shows the proposed structure. Regional coalitions or partnerships identify local priorities reflecting local values and needs. The co-op serves as an advisor for developing an overarching statewide vision, criteria, and guidelines. Together, these inform statewide conservation, and rec a statewide conservation and recreation plan. If you think this sounds similar to Colorado um, CPW's Comprehensive Outdoor Recreation Plan, or SCORP, we agree, and we intend to combine these planning processes moving forward. CPW supports this effort as a convener of the co-op and by providing resources to regional partnerships. In addition, we provide a link to the DNR Interagency Council that convenes state agencies whose work connects 
with outdoor recreation and conservation, such as CDPHE, CDOT, and OEDIT. Looking at the timeline for the, this initiative, we plan to continue to engage existing coalitions and the co-op to develop the framework, criteria, and guidelines. Then we will support regional efforts and implementation, including developing plans to roll up into the next SCORP expected in 2023. As with many aspects of our work right now, the schedule for the immediate future is unpredictable. This initiative is a priority and we expect that it will move forward as soon as is practical. So with that, I'm gonna turn the mic back over to the director and to the commission for comments and questions. Thank you. Great, okay. Um, Dan, Jody, thank you. And um, I, yeah, this is something we've talked about a lot. I've asked about a lot. I think I really appreciate the update and this is, uh, obviously a, a very a very hot topic as we're seeing right now with Director Prenzel's comment about uh, park users, park usership or um, you know people getting out there on the land increasing um, even during this time of as Commissioner Adams called it the great pause. So I think which I like <laughs> I'm gonna start using that. Um, so I think yeah this this may merit some some discussion. It may also lead nicely into the next agenda items. Uh, Director Prenzel, do you have any comments or any commissioner questions or discussion? Hey, Madam Chair, uh, Director Prenzel, uh, first want to thank uh, Dan and Jody for that. They've been instrumental in, in working through this uh, issue as we try and get ahead of that. Um, we were for sure going to make you know, a big announcement of this about the partners meeting and obviously things change through all of life and so we're, we're making double down on on that we have all our T's crossed and I's audited until we come up with a kind of a phased in approach. But it, it's hugely important for Colorado. It's all the partners really generally completely understand uh, uh, in co-op and around the state that we've, we've got to get ahead of, well, I won't even say ahead of this. We're far enough behind this in Colorado that uh, we're doing the best we can to catch up and and uh, and just to manage as best we can. So again, appreciate staff. We really, I wanted to make sure that we talked about this uh, at the commission because the commission still has, the commission is the commission. We're not gonna usurp the commission's authority whatsoever in this, but uh, we want the commission to be al alongside because we're, you, the, the problems land either on my desk and or as a policy level or are going to be at the commission level. And so we gotta make sure you knew what, we're working hard to try and get out ahead of this so we can uh, jointly um, you know, manage for positive uh, uh, future aspects in the state of Colorado. So that's, that's it. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Director Prenzlow. Uh um, <clears throat> Jody, I had a word of other questions. Oh, and then I do have a hand up. So one, one of my questions is, is um, I love the, the timeline up, lining up with the SCORP. I imagine there are also some line, some uh, things that line up with our operational plan with regard to the implementation of our strategic plan. I'm also curious if there are um, ways that we're feeding into or incorporating um, with the state trails committee and uh, the next agenda items, some of those, some of those kinds of things. As we start to address this recreation and conservation um, nexus, are we also bringing in some of the ways that we weight um, and score those our, those proposals into our um, RFP? And and so I don't know if you can speak to any of that. And then I have a couple of hands up. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. So that's a really good question. And, and yes, since uh, we first started talking about this initiative, we've been working really closely with the trails program. And we've spoken with that committee and Fletcher is, is part of our internal team. And so we are looking for opportunities to really kind of engage these local regional planning efforts to help identify their local priorities. And then we would use those planning efforts to then help inform um, I, I think 
a lot of our funding initiatives across the agency and the, and the trails program obviously has a lot of synergy there. And so I think what we would hope is that you would see these local planning efforts kind of identify priorities for trails and, and outdoor recreation, and then would be able to bring those forward through our planning efforts like the trails program um, and iron out a lot of the um, kind of issues on the ground locally before they even are presented to, to our statewide funding. Uh, boards like the Trails Committee. Great, thank you. Figured you were on top of it, but I appreciate the additional update. Uh, Commissioner Garcia. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so uh, Jody, Dan, I was looking at your slide with the partners and I see GoCo, uh, have you or would you, I hope, come and speak to the GOCO board uh, about all of the work that you're doing? And then the second part, is there anybody uh, from GOCO, either staff or board members, on the co-op directly? Yeah, absolutely, Commissioner Garcia. Good question. So GOCO serves on the Colorado Outdoor Partnership. They have also been part of an internal um, or a small co-op steering committee slash working group that we've been working really close with in, in developing this initiative. And yes, we see them as a, as a key partner um, in, this, in this initiative. And have you, uh, I'd like to see someone, you or Dan or both, or someone come and speak to the board. I'm not sure uh, that maybe our board understands that our partnership role in this. Uh, I don't yeah, know absolutely. We can we can bring that up um, with Chris Castilian and Emily Urbana. That'd yeah, that'd be great. I don't know. I'm sure they're still working. I know they are. We had an executive council meeting yesterday, so they uh, are still working on our May committee meeting agenda. So they're not even close to our June board meeting agenda yet. Uh, Madam Chair, this is Director Prenzlau. Yep, go ahead, Director. I just might add to that, uh, Commissioner Garcia, is, not only is uh, GOCO on it, it is, it is Chris Castilian, uh, and, and he participates. There's alternates in there, but um, uh, dare I say that the co-op board is really kind of who's who of Colorado. I mean, Dan Gibbs is on there, Chris Castilian's on there, uh, Terry Fankhauser's on there, Eric Glenn's on there. I can go down the list, but it is a hugely powerful and um, kind of executive level uh, group. And then there's a steering committee in there, which we can talk about, but uh, GOCO is well represented on that. Okay, great. Um, so I do have a, a few hands up. Uh, first one is Emily Orbanic, or sorry, I'm going backwards. Commissioner, Commissioner Blecka. Uh, thank you. You mean you can you can have Emily comment since you know we're talking about GoCo, and then you can okay. Yeah, Emily, go ahead, and then we'll we'll thanks Betsy. We'll go back to Commissioner Blicka. Thanks, Madam Chair, and I just wanted to recognize Commissioner Garcia's comments. Um, we have been working pretty closely with uh, Jody and Dan over the last six months at a at a staff level, and Chris is very involved in the co-op conversations. Um, and we at you know, GOCO staff and CPW staff have tried to keep on parallel tracks with our strategic planning process and you know, the rollout of, of the regional partnership model. So um, I will certainly relay your comments. And um, we have actually, in the last couple of weeks, have just talked about getting um, this in front of the GOCO board to make sure that we have continuity between the two bodies. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Emily. Uh, okay, Commissioner Blecka. Thanks. I just wanted to uh, just make a short comment. Um, the Colorado Outdoor Recreation Industry Office was part of a large audit agency on working region workers. Okay, region spending like a partners of the state. We've been working with the last five years. Although the meat one is to make some meat. However, 
agency. That's all. So, Commissioner Blecka, that was really choppy on my end. Um, Jody, were you able to pick that up? No, I apologize, Commissioner Blecka, but I, I did not hear your question or comment. And you've already done what you can't you your videos, so I don't. Um, Maybe can you try just one more time, Betsy, just to see if you can restate that just because. Is this coming, how is this now? Is it coming in great? Is it better? Great. Okay, I'll make it quick or increase my service goals away. Um, I just wanted to say that um, the Colorado Outdoor Recreation Industry Office, uh, OREC has, you know, already has working groups within the state in the four, you know, four corners or the four, you know, quadrants of the state um, that look at, you know, the economic impacts of outdoor recreation. And I think that they'd be a great resource um, to coordinate with and to synthesize a lot of these efforts. Got it. That was much better. Thank you. Jody. did you catch that? Yeah. Thanks, Commissioner Blecka. Um, that came through clearly. And yeah, absolutely. Really good point. Uh, so Nathan Fay, the director of the Outdoor Recreation Industry Office, is, is also on the Colorado Outdoor Partnership and has been part of our internal team. And we have met um, with several of the, the outdoor recreation industry coalitions around the state and, and definitely see a strong nexus to, to bring those folks um, together as part of this initiative. Great, thank you. Um, good points, Commissioner Blecka, thank you. Um, Commissioner Adams. There we go. Yes, hello everybody. Um, Jody, thank you so much for um, that update and it's really helpful to see the vision forward. I have two quick questions. One is, um, are there any reports around the outcomes of the first plan, um, the first SCORP plan, um, you know, as far as <laughs> things that can be leveraged to inform the next plan? Um, so specifically, you know, the, the strengths, the challenges, um, the growth opportunities, any un, unintended consequences, um, both positive or negative. So that kind of thing would be wonderful. And, and, and I went on the website, but I wasn't able to find it on the um, coloradopartners.org. So if I miss it, I missed it, I apologize. Um, and feel free to um, just send that to me. But curious about how we are capturing the information or the outcomes, the outcomes and the outputs um, of the previous SCORP plan and then using that to inform the new one. So that's question number one. Question number two is around the composition of the, of the partnerships. And so I know um, you and I have spoken about this. I've also talked to, to Dan Zimmerman about it and had really great conversations with the both of you around the composition um, of the co-op. And so, you know, when I went to that meeting for the first time last year, um, it wasn't clear to me, what is the criteria for joining the, the co-op? Um, how long is the term? Um, and then I also just noticed, you know, when I went into that room, um, the lack of racial and ethnic diversity in that room. So I'm, I'm wondering about, you know, the opportunities to make sure that we're being more inclusive around um, historically marginalized communities as well as disinvested communities. Um, so I'm thinking about organizations like Latino Outdoors where we're starting to build a really meaningful relationship with them. Obviously Outdoor Afro where I'm one of the co-leaders. Um, Asians Outdoors, I'm very close with Jamie Diaz in that group. Um, Native Women's Wilderness, Natives Outdoors. So again, I, I'm, I'm noticing a mix of uh, outdoor recreation groups and conservation and sports persons, et cetera. Um, and that's wonderful, but I'm still not seeing the, 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 the inclusion that is mentioned in those DNR, DEI uh, efforts around just making sure that we're hearing from all Coloradans and being more inclusive um, and maybe even amplifying voices that have been historically left out of the, of the decision-making uh, room. So I uh, would love to hear your responses to those. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Adams. Those are really good points that you raised. And I do want to draw attention to the Partners in the Outdoors Conference, which is still moving forward in a virtual, in a virtual format. Um, but unfortunately, we were not able to convene last week in Vail. Uh, 
the plan was that the Partners in the Outdoors Conference was to kind of keep the theme going of tying that conference to the SCORP and using that as an opportunity for our partners to come together. And the SCORP is really seen as, as a partner's plan. So it's not a CPW plan. CPW has a strategic plan. We really see the SCORP as a collaborative planning process um, that reflects shared strategies and shared priorities. And the intent of the Partners Conference was to come back and have people report on how, um, the work that they were doing and how they were working to achieve uh, the priorities and the strategies laid out in that five-year plan. Um, there's some of the, the score priorities will still be presented in a, in a virtual format over the following um, over the following months, and you know we will certainly be looking at how that how the conference report again ties back to the score and kind of shows the good work that is being done to advance that plan. Um, to the to your second point about diversity. Um, on the co-op and, and thinking about equity, diversity, and inclusion as part of this initiative. Um, that is a really important point. And the co-op has recognized that they need to rethink membership and, and that that needs to evolve as part of this initiative. And again, that was one of those things that we were planning to launch um, with the Partners Conference and with a formal announcement for this Partners Initiative. And at this point, that has been, um, you know, that has been delayed, but that is still the plan. And we still intend on being more kind of thoughtful and deliberate about how we represent diversity on the co-op and, and think about equity and inclusion. Um, it's definitely part of our thinking uh, for that coalition as we move forward. And it's also been identified as a priority for this initiative. So as we start working with regional groups around the state, you know, we're, we're really trying to look at how do we connect people to the outdoors, how those opportunities are available equitably, um, while at the same time, you know, making sure we conserve our wildlife, our lands, and our waters. So does, does that answer your question? Um, yes and no. Yes, um, in the sense that it's nice to know that this is on their radar screen. I was in a meeting when this was being discussed. I raised this issue um, during that meeting as the only African American in the room. Um, and at that time, they said the same thing to me, which is we see that this is a problem and, that, and we're trying to address it. Um, and then I just offered that you know, we'll never, you'll, uh, you'll never see your own back, which is to say, um, there are some challenges in having the members of the co-op identify new members because we already had that and this is what we got. <laughs> so um, that's why I just wanna make sure that, um, that we keep this conversation going. Um, and again, Jody, I know that we, we, we've had great conversations. I, you know, I, I appreciate the thought and um, commitment um, to these issues. Uh, and so I, you know, again, it's not a criticism, but more so just really hoping that when I look at this um, composition, um, that the glaring <laughs> gaps have been addressed um, and whatever we can do um, to, to support that, obviously we're willing to, to do that. And I think, again, CPW in the work that we've been doing um, around inclusion, you know, like the luncheon that we had planned and the one that we had um, in the Denver office, um, along with other events and partnerships that are going on. I mean, there is a real interest and there's real movement in that direction. Um, but I think this, because this is such a public facing um, partnership, I think it's really important that we get that composition right. And that, you know, it's ongoing. Um, to the the report piece, I'm, I, is there a document that has <laughs> that's like a findings report or outcomes report? Is there even in a is there in a, a, a formal evaluation that that is done on it? I'm just trying to understand the about you know how we are you know capturing uh, collecting the data, analyzing the data, and reporting on the data before we start a new plan. Yeah, I think that's a I think that's a good point there is not a report for this year for the SCORP. There was the report that came out of the Partners Conference last year, which touches on work being done to advance each of the priorities. And, and this year, the plan was to have a follow-up report that would continue touching on um, those priorities and strategies and, and the work that's being done. Um, and I think we, we still need to sort of get through our, our kind of our, the virtual and 
and Dan Zimmer, if you're all free to chime in, but I think the plan is to kind of work through a, a virtual format over the following months and then, and then see um, how that report will look. For the, awesome. For the SCORP as a, as a five-year plan, um, we don't have anything in addition to that in terms of kind of reporting out on that plan, uh, at least at the, at the moment, as we get farther into that planning process and, and closer to start thinking about the next five-year plan. Um, then, then you should see more reports come out about how, how we're achieving the current strategies and priorities. And correct me if I'm wrong, Jody, but the um, this the past scorp plan that was the first was that the first big lift around the scorp, or um, is there always kind of like a plan? I'm just trying to if 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 last the last one was more of the baseline, and we were just collecting kind of baseline, and then we we can start to see growth over the years. I was just trying to figure out where we were on the cycle if we're starting to make a new plan. So I think. Um, you know, the SCORP is a plan developed with partners and it doesn't have kind of clear measurable benchmarks like you see right. in PW strategic. Plan. But it's Our the federal requirement, plan. right? The federal, the federal requirement, yeah, is to conduct a plan every five years. And um, there's, there's not a, it's not similar hmm. to like having concrete measurable metrics um, because it's mm -hmm. not a CPW plan. Right. So we really reach out to our partners to right. check in with them. Now, I will say there are several items in the SCORP that do directly connect to our strategic plan. And so for right. those, we can kind of give you measurable outcomes. The okay. other really look to our partners to kind of report on, on their progress. Um, mm -hmm. So there's so much work right. done in this space. Um, across the state, it would, it would be really hard to kind of pinpoint everything that's happening. Right. Um, yes. And um, I wonder how, as we look ahead, um, to really address that measurement piece, right? I mean, I, I, you know, I, I think, you know, um, the collective ownership is, is great, but that means we are collectively, you know, we own the results as well. And so how do we get more skin in the game? <laughs> from our partners as far as committing to, and how can we le leverage their existing um, strategic goals, right? These are mission aligned organizations and agencies. And so it's not, you know, I'm, the metric may be different, um, but the, the measure of, you know, increasing access or conserving public land or, you know, those things are similar. So finding those similarities so that people aren't doing duplicative reporting, like I don't want it to be a, a reporting burden either. So I, I you know, I, um, I'm trying to figure out where the, where's the balance. Yeah. Thank you, though. I appreciate it. I see Dan Zimmer has his hand up. Dan, would you like to add to that? Um, Dan, do you, have, do you want to comment on that? And then we'll go to Commissioner Schaefer. Dan, you're on mute. Commissioner Adams, I do appreciate your comments. And I would like to add that we, we were, the reporting piece on the SCORP we were bringing into the Partners Conference, simply through the fact that the structure of the conference was around the four priority areas of the SCORP. Um, for example, we received over 70 different session proposals from our partners and we chose a balance of sessions that reported on access and opportunity, a balance of sessions that reported on the stewardship priority area from the SCORP, and likewise with the land and water conservation priority area and the, the future funding piece. So that was one way we were starting to bring in, uh, you know, it's not data reporting, but more qualitative uh, hearing from our partners. How are you working to achieve those identified priority areas? And that was, I think, the first step in that process. Thank you, Dan. And again, I could see, you know, that those sessions and it, it, you know, it's there. Um, you know, the, the it's what it's how we can build on those strengths, really. So, thank you for that. Absolutely. Thank you. Good discussion, um, Commissioner Schaefer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and forgive me if this was uh, remarked upon earlier while I was having my technical difficulties, but uh, when you started, Jody and Dan, I, I heard a. Uh, allusion to the base and round tables um, that that effort's been really successful and really interesting in terms of creating these base and round tables, tying it off the interbasin compact committee, 
but also uh, providing for the funding for the implementation of various plans within the roundtables themselves, whether it be different assessments or the basin implementation plans. My question is, um, because it has been successful, but it's also been very heavily funded, is there, has there been any identified uh, funding or revenue sources that, that potentially would be uh, uh, sort of uh, guided towards these roundtables to be able to formulate the plans and strategies necessary to have sort of holistic management direction? Yeah, Commissioner Schaefer, that's a really good question. I think um, CPW was really committed to supporting kind of the, the planning phase and initial phase, both in terms of our, our staff and, and shared resources on the ground and, and working to get these partnerships or regional coalitions established and to share resources with them and, and support them initially. And I think the hope was that in working with these local groups, they could then help to identify what their priorities are and articulate those and capture those on paper. And then they can roll up into this sort of statewide plan um, that matches priorities and a vision across the state. And then that could help inform kind of the larger conversation and funding efforts. Uh, and so down the road, when, when we're looking for new funding measures, you know, there's a clear list of priorities and projects that have been vetted at the local level and reflect local values and priorities as well as state level priorities. And so um, that's a little bit of a dodge in that no, there's no um, pot of money, particularly right now with the changing financial situation and uncertain financial situation. Um, but that, is, that was something we were thinking about. And, and I think we see the power right now is that CPW has a lot of boots on the ground um, across the state. And so with our, with, our, with our field staff and our CY teams, we, we can provide a lot of support to get this going. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I also certainly appreciate that we're looking at a very uh, uncertain future financially. Um, I do think that um, ultimately we're, we are going to have to figure out how to uh, provide funding for this 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 type of, of uh, such a collaborative planning effort, um, because it is uh, so important and it involves so many different uh, stakeholders across the state. It's a great opportunity to continue to build upon what I think is already a great start. So I'm excited to see what we can do in the future, recognizing that there's gonna be some serious challenges when it comes to the money. Well, well said, um, not to kick that can down the road, Commissioner Schaefer, but <laughs> I think, I think um, yeah, really well said. It's something we definitely need to address. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and you know, I think hopefully we'll, we'll obviously have a little more conversation with Justin tomorrow as well. Our sponsor, can we move on to the next agenda item? Nothing? Okay. All right, great. Thank you, Dan and Jody. Um, really appreciate the update. Looking forward to the virtual partners conference. And um, let's move on to agenda item number 15, Fletcher. Jacobs, are you on the line? The 2021 OHB grant recommendations. I am here, yes. Uh, Great. Welcome, Fletcher. Thanks so much for joining us. And yes, it looks like, yep, we got your screen. Excellent. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Director Prinslow, members of the Commission uh, Council. Uh, my name is Fletcher Jacobs, State Trails Program Manager. Um, I am here today to present um, se several items on the agenda. And I'm going to start with an action item, the 2021 OHV Trail Grant funding recommendations for your approval. So the Colorado Parks and Wildlife uh, Trails Program is a statewide program within CPW, and we administer grants for trail-related projects on an annual basis. Local county and state governments, federal agencies, special recreation districts, and non-for-profit non organizations with management responsibilities over public lands may apply for and, and be eligible to receive motorized trail grants. The program is primarily funded through the sale of OHV registrations and use permits, as well as some additional funding from the Federal Recreational Trails Program. Last year, we estimate that 200,000 off-highway vehicles were registered or permitted for use in Colorado. The price of an annual OHV registration or use permit 
is $25.25. Those funds are used to support the statewide OHV program, um, the OHV registration unit, the search and rescue fund, and of course the OHV trail grant program, which we're here talking about today, including um, additional OHV law enforcement crews. The goal, of this, the goal of this program is to improve and enhance motorized recreational opportunities in Colorado while promoting safe and responsible use of off-highway vehicles that protects our state's natural resources. This program benefits the OHV users who are able to enjoy the on-the-ground trail improvements, the communities that economically benefit from the rec um, recreational use, the general public as the program helps OHV users become better educated as well as better stewards of the land and also funds projects that directly address environmental concerns. And finally, the public land managers who are able to use these funds to better manage their resources. So this will, th this slide will look very familiar for, <laughs> from last week. Uh, similar to the non-motorized grant programs, uh, OHV trail grant application review and ranking process also follows a four tiered review and award protocol. Um, these grant applications are announced in early October um, and sent out via email, ground mail, and also, of course, posted on our, our website. Uh, we send out information through our press releases, newsletters, um, as well as our email informational networks. The submission deadline for OHV grant applications is the first business day of December. All grant applications are first reviewed by CPW wildlife field biologists and regional CPW staff. This process allows us to identify potential wildlife issues prior to review by the subcommittees. While concerns may be flagged during this review, our field staff do attempt to resolve these concerns prior to, the, prior to review whenever possible. These regional wildlife impact summaries are shared with the subcommittee as part of Appendix B of the action item. Next, the applications are about um, evaluate, evaluate, excuse me, evaluated by the OHV grant review and ranking subcommittee, the score and rank, the competitive grant applications, as well as as well as to discuss our good management grants. The OHV grant review and ranking subcommittee is comprised of 16 scoring members, eight of whom are affiliated directly with OHV recreational interests. Three subcommittee members are represented uh, non-motorized recreational interest. One subcommittee member represents multiple use trail recreational interest and four are uh, four CPW regional trail coordinators. State and federal agencies are also represented on an ex officio basis by the United States Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, CPW Trails Program staff, as well as two members of our leadership team. Appendix A lists the OHV subcommittee members and their affiliation, affiliation as, well, as well as the State Trails Committee. The State Trails Committee takes the ranked applications and also approves them and then sends them up um, for, with the recommended funding strategies to the commission, as I'm here today presenting on. And finally, we seek your approval. And I think is always important because unlike last week, these are dollars that will actually be awarded for the next field season. Just because of the sheer volume, we typically operate in a cycle um, several months ahead just to keep ahead of the contracting. So the dollars that the commission approved last year are the ones that are actually getting spent right now. These are dollars that will come into the 20, uh, tw excuse me, to the 21 field season. So this slide shows you a summary of this year's applications. We received 67 eligible projects prior to this December 2nd deadline. The total funding requests uh, for a little, a little over $5 million. We offer two types of OHV trail grants. As you can see here at the top, we have 67 total. The first type of grant application is the good management crews. Um, and then the second is our programmatic or competitive grant applications. The OHV good management program allows federal agencies to proactively make, maintain high use motorized recreational areas and to implement adopted travel management plans for those areas. The program provides a consistent and predictable level of funding so that federal agencies can attract and retain experienced trail crews for the operation and maintenance of their OHV riding areas. Since its inception in 2001, the trail crews supported by the OHV Good Management Program have grown from three to 23. And this year we are recommending funding for an additional, so bringing it up to a total number of 24. To be eligible for the Good Management Program, applicants must demonstrate over a consecutive period of three, three plus years their ability to fulfill the fiscal and field objectives as presented in their annual OHV grant proposals and achieve all aspects of the good management program. That means taking a holistic management approach that preserves riding opportunities while protecting sensitive resources within the areas they service. Service includes trail and support facility maintenance, reconstruction, monitoring, signage, tra trail inventory, education, mapping, compliance checks, and in the case of the US Forest Service, law enforcement. These trail crews use best practices to maintain and restore OHV riding areas. 
The second uh, application category is our competitive projects. And these are very similar. They address the full spectrum of OHV recreational support um, needs in the state to directly support those OHV routes, trailheads, equipment, education, and also can include law enforcement. You can see the ap total application summaries uh, provided in Appendix D. 23 of the 67 applications were um, requesting good management, uh, continued good management, and we had one, three additional competitive grants that were requesting moving up into the good management application. You can see here in the middle, um, just the breakdown of what the actual, um, actual ask were for. So 43% were to what we call maintenance. Um, so actually kind of that trail work out on, um, out on the ground of clearing, erosion control, um, bridge work, those types of things. 12% uh, were for enforcement as well as visitor contacts. 16% uh, for that direct travel plan implementation, meaning primarily inventorying as well as decommissioning and non-system routes um, and, occasion and new construction um, when it is appropriate. And then finally, uh, roughly a third of the ask are for new equipment, uh, material signs, as well as additional use for um, time in the field. You can see here at the bottom, um, again, our total requests were over 5 million. And this is, we had 4.4, $274 million available. Four million of those dollars from the source of fund perspective were from the OHV registration fund directly. And then the remaining um, $274,000 were from that uh, recreational trails program fund that we received through federal highways, which is a uh, fuel excise tax um, based on the use of highway vehicles. Um, just give you a little comparison for what we had last year. We had a little, a little over five and a half million dollar ask last year, but also had a little bit more money to give away just to give you a sense of uh, this, the comparison of the two cycles. This next slide shows a different, break, uh, different breakdown of the way we received the grants, just to try to give you a sense of the different agencies and basically who's asking for what from a numbers perspective. Um, as you can imagine, the US Forest Service with the, the vast majority of uh, OHV use in the state is by, um, does have the most requests and then followed by the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, Colorado State Parks, we have um, several of our, our state parks that do request funds because of um, their location and, and their interest. We also allow, again, county and towns, nonprofits, and then we do have one shared project um, between the U.S. Forest Service, uh, the Salida Ranger District, and our Arkansas Headwaters Recreational Area. You can also see up here on the far right a uh, breakdown by region of where these grants are actually going. So on this side, you actually have our um, the recommended funding levels. When we give the subcommittee this review, the first thing they look at are these good management crews and go through each of those applications one by one. As I said, we had three applicants who had requested um, moving up um, approval into good management um, program. The subcommittee is recommending elevating one of those, the Pagosa Ranger District, to good management status. Um, then we look at the, the competitive um, projects and with the remaining money, um, evaluate those and rank those and bring them forth to your consideration. Um, this year for the good management, we set the, the crews. It really varies depending on the, the ranger district for the forest service or, or of course the field office for the Bureau of Land Management. Um, uh, their needs can go from two crew members up to six. We do have a, a the scoring grid for all of the application. Um, appendix 